Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. For those who have gathered here and those joining us on the live stream, welcome to Rally Day. I'm so excited. My, my first announcement today, I get to say the word gaga. So we're excited to welcome our kids back to Sunday school. I, I'm seeing small people. Uh, I, I'm telling you, I missed you during the summer. The uh, fellowship hour is going to be in the social center, not here, where there will be uh, coffee, but also cupcakes, which is like a, a, a cake gone wild, right? Many cakes for all. But the big thing over there today, right, after worship is the Gaga Pit, Paul Gunser. I expect to see you in the Gaga Pit, because it says for all ages. Not really, Paul. It'd probably be best not. Um, as you consider the programs you want your children or youth to be part of, including all of our choirs, please register using the forms on our website. If you go to our website, there are forms to register children for programs and choirs. It's easy. It's convenient to use. We also have uh, paper copies, if you would like that as well. Uh, music ministry. Please note the first rehearsal dates of the different choirs as posted in the Sunday paper. I know if you're like me, you, you need about eight times to remember something like this. So check out that bulletin and find that out. If you have no child to... Oh, I already said this. Uh, next Sunday, after worship, in uh, the, cha in the uh, room 109, we're going to have a after worship gathering for those who are interested in going to Egypt or who would just like to learn a bit more about modern Egyptian uh, history and politics. Next Sunday, after worship. I believe that exhausts all of my announcements. Good morning. Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise, O oh servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the Lord our God? Who is seated on high? Who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? Like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. Our God provides joy to the downcast, a song of hope to those who
In our most honest moments, we must acknowledge that our thoughts and actions have not measured up. Let us turn towards God's everlasting love and forgiveness by collectively confessing our sins as one body, saying, God of mercy, forgive our crossing, our cursing, our words ever prone to tear down instead of building up. Let us critique faith and our hope grow. Let our hope be more than resignation, our trust more than apathy. Make us a fellowship of common joy. Amen. God's love knows no bounds. The good news is this. Because we have confessed, we are forgiven. Let us rejoice as one beloved community. Amen. Welcome to Rally Day. We are so excited. Before the children come forward, I'd like to ask the teachers to please come forward. And assistants. Well, I'm so thankful that you're going to teach this year. And it's part of our tradition here that we, we install you in the act of teaching. So I'm going to ask the congregation a question. Do we, the members of the congregation, commit to pray for these teachers to encourage them as they teach our children? Do you? And now I'll ask you a question. Do you as teachers promise to use all your energy, intelligence, imagination, and love that God has put into your heart for our children? If so, please say, we do. No, I didn't. Let's do it again. Please say, we do. We do. Okay, good. So let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, we give you thanks for the teachers here. Strengthen them. Give them a voice of clarity, of hope, so that the words they speak to children will reach their heart. Amen. All right, I'd like to invite children forward. If you've got a backpack or if you don't have a backpack, come on up. Come on up. I'm so excited about this. All right, all right, come on up here. And you can sit on a pew or you can sit on the floor, whichever one you want. Right in here, right in here. I'll tell you what, I'll sit down with you. How about that? Just like this, see? This will be a challenge for me to get up, but I'll do it. Okay, so this is my friend Hannah. Guess what she has? A backpack. Now, last week, I asked Hannah what grade she was in. Anyone want to guess? Carly? Seven? No. <laughs> no, no. Cora? Hundredth grade. Hundredth grade? Ooh. Keep going. Keep going. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Seventeenth grade. Ooh. Yep, it does. It, does. <laughs> it even goes past that. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. Right. I know. So wait a minute. I, before we do the blessing of the back plaques, we want to talk about what a blessing is. So a blessing is a promise of good. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak a promise of good to you for your backpacks. But I need one backpack. I need to hold on to one backpack. Does anyone have one? All right, Carly, I want you to give me your backpack. I'm going to hold this backpack. Okay. And with this one, I'm holding everyone else's. Does that make sense? So this, this represents all backpacks. Well, wow, you've got a lot of stuff in here, Carly. Good job. You're ready. Okay, so you're, and if you don't have your backpack with you, it still counts. Okay? It's, it's at your house, right? Okay. Let's pray together and bless this backpack. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for those who carry the backpacks. May you put love and hope and joy inside, but also let all the good things of knowing and learning and finding out new things reach our hearts as well. Fill our backpacks with good things. Amen. All right, so now it's Sunday school time and then fun afterwards, and I'm so glad you're here. Carly? My computer's not in here yet, so it's going to get heavy. Okay. <laughs> okay. On to Sunday school. first scripture reading is Jonah 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of soul I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I was with the voice of thanksgiving, but with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of the Lord.
That was fun. Yeah, well done. I heard during the installation of Rabbi Axe here on Friday that a perfect rabbi only speaks for seven and a half minutes. So uh, you're out of luck. I'm a Presbyterian pastor. Uh, sorry for that. Our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, a rather fitting passage, I think, for today. Then little children were brought to him in order that Jesus might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them. But Jesus said, let, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them. For to such as these that are the kingdom of God belongs. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, help us to see and know and trust how it is we are to bless the little ones. Amen. I was a lot smarter and wiser when I was 16 Bob Dylan said, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. My level of sophistication was on full display in Mr. Houston's American history class. Discussing the attack on Pearl Harbor, I took the position that Roosevelt knew. Knew before the attack and let the events unfold. This would give him latitude. Roosevelt was determined to bring the U.S. into the fight against the Axis powers. An attack on Pearl Harbor would remove all obstacles. I took this as realistic, jaded for sure, but better than naive optimism. Such was the 16-year-old me. Mr. Houston was, was gracious, as always, gave my cynicism some breathing room, gently tried to challenge my surety. And this was par for the course until Glenn waded in. My remark upset my classmate, Glenn. That's not possible, he said. What you're saying is not possible. No president would knowingly allow an attack. What I did next stays with me. More to the point, the look on Glenn's face haunts me. Without blinking, I, I laid out the benefits of entering the war. Larger picture, likely loss of life, and how calculations are part of war. Not the best part of life, but part, nonetheless. Then I went in for the kill. President Truman calculated the loss of life that would occur if the war in the Pacific continued, calculated the material cost of a protracted war, and then he dropped the bomb. How is that different than Roosevelt allowing the Japanese to attack Pearl Harbor? A change came over Glenn. I could see it. I watched his face go from confidence and surety and pride to shock and confusion and sadness. What I considered banter became loss of innocence. I think we both lost some innocence that day. Soren Kierkegaard had a theory about this. Kierkegaard believed that the, the story in the Bible about Adam and Eve and the garden, the temptation and fall, this story is not so much a historic occurrence, isolated. The story of the temptation and fall in the garden, the loss of innocence, is the shared experience of all people. We not, may not be in a perfect world in a garden, but 
we all have the experience of losing our adolescence, the dreaming innocence of childhood. Something happens, something is said, and we go from the dappled, soft light to a harsh noonday glare of too much information, too much knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. Everyone experiences this change. It can be through tragedy or revelation, no matter how it happens. And it's unpleasant. Quite often, people feel betrayed, fooled, as if misled until now. About 20 years ago, there was a misguided but well-intended attempt to develop a curriculum for children, a curriculum about the environment. It was designed to convey information about nature, but it would also serve to illumine the danger to our ecosystem. Global warming, deforestation, species facing extinction, pollution. The intent was to create an awareness in children, an awareness of threat, while they were learning about nature. With this awareness, they would become defenders of the environment. Well, it backfired. They, there was certainly an impact on young learners. They, they were convinced about the danger of the environment, but they were also convinced that they were in danger. Instead of wanting to save the planet, the young learners were now afraid of the planet. They took the threat to the environment personally and were now determined to stay away from nature. The curriculum had the unintended consequence of removing dreaming innocence, the type of innocence that doesn't see the snake as a threat, the freedom of not seeing danger. For the most part, we try to maintain innocence, not remove it. True, sometimes we hear a parent or a teacher or a coach say, well, it's time that they learn. And by learn, they mean the harsh realities of life. For the most part, though, we try to shield children from the unpleasantry of life. The desire to protect, to shield, to keep from danger is a parental impulse an act of love. We tell children the stove is hot as opposed to letting them discover by being burnt. We shout stop as they near the busy street as opposed to letting them discover the danger on their own. It's part of the blessing we seek for them. And then at some point, we pivot. It's time for them to grow up, right? Sometimes this is about money or work or responsibility, but whatever it is, we change our posture with children. The blessings change. I can remember sitting with, with a dear friend discussing this moment of change, the pivot. His son lived for more than a decade in and out of addiction, recovery, and treatment. He chased his son and shielded him from the consequences of self-destruction. And then something changed. There was a moment of change for both. When his son called from jail once again, Jim told him, you're on your own. He said he wasn't coming to bail him out. Jim said that was the hardest day of his life. 
And it was. His son would describe it later as the beginning of his recovery with the consequences no longer kept at bay, the dream world ended. Jim and his son are the cautionary tale we hope we never live. Our kids don't need to hit rock bottom in jail before they take their first steps toward maturity. We pray that young people will discard the the innocence of adolescence with ease and grace. The challenges of life will be seen at a distance and then gradually brought to the fore. The travesties of history, the, the legacies of greed and empire will be the stuff of college curriculum, not fifth grade projects, right? We want our children to know they're blessed not cursed. We want them to come unto God as a loving parent, not the angry God in the sky who must be avenged. Right? Church and the Bible and faith and religion should be offered as a place of compassion and mercy before they're ever considered in terms of judgment. This is the blessing we seek for children as they move toward maturity. Along the way, we shield them from harsh truths, the depths of tragedy. Peter Pan defeats Captain Hook. Superman, he's a good guy. And if you brush your teeth and clean your room and do your homework, all will be well. A good career will be yours, and 2.5 children in a 2,000-square-foot ranch with a nice backyard will be yours as well. Right? We try to keep them safe. At bedtime, don't we say, sweet dreams? Today is the 21st anniversary of 9-11, when 2,997 people died, when hijacked aircraft were flown into three buildings in a farm field. This is something we should not forget, uh, nor relegate to obscurity. For this reason, every day, young people in Metuchen walk past a memorial to those we lost on 9-11. At first, I thought, rally day, 9-11, hmm, not a great fit. And mind you, it, it's not easy. But the more I thought about it and ruminated, what I came to see was the light that shines on what rally day really means for how and where and when we 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 teach our children about justice and mercy is the point of christian education we want to teach our children that god is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love we, we want to teach our children that that jesus is god with us a life lived where justice and mercy find perfection. We, we want our children to know about God, and we want them to know how hard it is to be godly. Justice and mercy are real because of our brokenness. If everything is perfect, there's no need for justice. If everything is good, there's no need for mercy. But we don't believe that. We, We believe the world is broken and the church is a witness to how and when and where we can escape evil. Deliver us from evil. The world needs the church to teach children. We forget that. 
We are needed. We don't need to teach children that, that life is bad or broken. That's not where we're needed. Life will bring the tragedies, hardships, evils, destroying, dreaming, innocence. I was not being the church in Mr. Houston's American history class, and Glenn will never confuse me with Jesus. Life will reveal its harshness, and God will reveal to all love redeems, hope lifts us, faith sustains us. Jesus came and comes again to the world. This is our theology, the Reformed tradition. We believe the Holy Spirit is power, revealing truth. We're not here to prove good or evil. The church is here to teach humility, justice, and mercy. That's our job, our, our, our responsibility. And we're to do it in such a way that is graceful and kind and compassionate. Restore each person's dignity. Our Christian education is here to help a child navigate tragedy like 9-11 with mercy and justice and humility. And we're here to help the child weigh the 20 years of war that followed with justice and mercy and humility. In our schools, the, the tragic nature of history is a question of timing and maturity. When does a child, a young person, an adolescent, a young adult, when are they able to weigh and measure both the tragic event and tragic war of 9-11? How and when do you introduce the second tragedy, the 170,000 people killed in Afghanistan, the 20 years of sustained aggression? First grade? Fifth grade? Tenth grade? College? The world does not need the church to answer this question our role, our calling, the reason why we rally is to provide the definition of mercy, the ability to measure justice, the power of humility, enduring the weight of truth. That's why we have Christian education. That's why we read the Bible the world reveals its harshness just as God reveals the unity of all things is love. The church has a different path. We're here to train and guide our children unto the art of being both just and merciful. We're here to be honest about how difficult it is to hold justice and mercy together. I believe my generation is the last one to hear, if you don't have something nice to say, what? Don't say anything at all. <laughs> if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Just a show of hands. How many people grew up hearing that? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we're the, the other generation. Nowadays, if you don't have something awful to say, you're supposed to be quiet. The demand to only say nice things kept a lot of truth unspoken. Yet to speak without filter or decorum allows falsity too much room when and how and where we tell children the truth can be a blessing or a curse. The church has something nice to say. We do. We, what we say is this, come unto Jesus as a child and be blessed. 
Amidst the harshness of life, we offer blessings, words of grace. Amidst hard things, we can speak tender words of blessings, just as Jesus did. As a parent, we want our children to be blessed. We want their dreams to be sweet. Abide in the freedom of innocence. As a church, we're called to train our children, teach them about justice and mercy and humility, so to navigate the loss of innocence. Hence, Jesus says, don't keep the children from me. Let them come unto me. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Let the children be blessed at home and here. Let them know innocence and truth so to do justice and love mercy. For this we rally. Amen. This is the moment where we can offer back to God a moment of thanks. Um, 
I've never done this before, so why not try it now? I've never turned to those who are watching the live stream and said that there's a special button I'm told about where you can participate in the offering. So, but for those who are gathered here, if the ushers are ready, let them come. Almighty God, these gifts we bring to you. We bring our heart, we bring our desire, we bring our love. Let these gifts bring faith where there is fear, hope where there is dread, and love where there's heartbreak. Let these gifts be our love offered. Amen. Friends, in the name of the one for whom peace meant friendship and reconciliation and commitment to community and freedom, may the peace of Christ be with you. And let us take a moment now to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
And then uh, prepare ourselves and take a posture of prayer. Please pray with me. Loving God, as the seasons change and we watch the environment around us ready itself for the process of renewal, the changing colors, the hibernating grass and greens, the bitter cold of fall and winter resting the ground until it comes to us again, similar but different. Ready ourselves for change and renewal. Ready our hearts to be wide open. Ready our minds to lean toward curiosity. Ready our spirits with the strength to be gentle with ourselves and with others. We are grateful for the seasons that renew us and bring us back to each other Similar, but different. And as we ready ourselves for what's ahead, we pray a blessing for us, for our community, for our young and yet to be, and for our older and gone before. We honor this entire community, together with all communities, all of us and all our loved ones. Bless the ones who began us, Bless the ones who teach and the ones who learn. Bless the ones who pray and create our sacred space. Bless the ones who trust and change the world. Bless the ones who do the hard work of building structure. And bless those who care for those in need and those who need care. God creator who created and is creating we honor the generations that made this community for the tapestry that is continuing to be made with us. We give love and thanks to the founders who sewed the first stitch. We give love and thanks for all the threads here for us today. And we give love and thanks for those who will continue into the future. And with all the voices of all of our lives here and before, let us pray together the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
something out of the sermon, so I wanted to just put it in here. Um, we rally so the children will find the power of justice and mercy and humility. But we live as those children too. The bid to have the children come, Jesus bids us come too. We are those children again and again and again. So to this end, this blessing, may the Lord bless you and keep you, be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you this day and bid you peace now and always.